Fitzgerald. He's a principal of Fitzgerald Group, and he joins me remotely this morning. Keith, thank you so much for waking up early. I believe you're on the West Coast, and I want to start by getting your take of the markets and whether or not this breather might turn into a longer consolidation phase. Well, first of all, thanks for having me. It is super early out here on the West Coast, but that's how you do things in this business. You get up and you get after it. I love where the markets are right now, and I love the fact that they are consolidating because you've got to take a little bit of profit off the table. That tells me people are still hungry. There's still a lot of liquidity that wants to come in. So, no, I don't think this is the start of anything more serious. I think this is just a technical correction, a technical pullback, whatever you want to call it. People are going to consolidate. Then they're going to find great companies and move forward because of all the earnings you just pointed out. Okay, so let's talk about the Fed because that, I think, could be the wild card here. The good news is the consumer seems strong. The economy seems to be humming along. We've seen that in the data, certainly GDP data, corporate earnings that are unfolding as we speak. Uh, but it seems like perhaps with a stronger than expected economy, the Fed rate cut projections might actually get dialed back. What is your view knowing that the path for rates does impact equities so much? Well, that really is the trillion dollar question, and you've hit it. Because if rates go up, the cost of borrowing and the leverage that many of the big traders use goes up. So they tend to dial it back. What's really being tested today is whether the Fed will maintain that rate cut path. And boy, that's a mouthful. I think the markets are trying to test Chairman Powell, see if he's really serious. So we've seen this before, for example, in the currency crisis of 2012. We saw it again a little bit on the heels of the global financial crisis of 2008 and 2009. So again, not unusual, just uncomfortable. Just uncomfortable. What is the data telling you about the strength of the consumer right now, Keith? Well, they're very mixed. You know, you clearly have a lot of people who are still hurting, and that's unfortunate because I believe, and I've been harshly critical of this, I think the Fed policies have contributed to this. So there are definitely splits in the marketplace. Many people are struggling to make ends meet. On the other hand, you've got great companies like NVIDIA, like Coca-Cola, who continue to put good numbers up, and they are strong, which is confounding the Fed because it can't model that. Interesting. Now, in terms of what this means for the investment outlook, Keith, what is your take there? I think you want to do two things. Number one, if you're if you're a golfer, you know, this is the time to keep it on the fairway. Two weeks ahead of the elections, you don't want to be taking wild swings. You don't want to be driving for the fences. What you want to be doing is just playing a nice, tight, close game so that you can focus on the companies that matter. Because the question is not the hot stocks, Christian. The question is which stocks are going to be there when you need them. That's how we approach the markets, and especially two weeks in the head of, of the elections. Mm -hmm. uh, well, certainly technicals are an element of the market as well. In addition to fundamentals, technicals, of course, chart patterns. Anything that you're seeing in the charts right now, Keith, that could indicate the direction from here? Well, what's really cool is if you look at history, right, we've had a very long six-week uh, consecutive marketplace. Anytime that happens, the history suggests that we're looking at another 10, 12, 24 months of upside. If you have the kind of growth that we've seen, we don't see that very often either. There's an 86% probability that we're 11 to 14% higher a year from now. So the history suggests that money wants to grow if you let it alone. Now, there's always wild cards, but again, the odds are pretty darn solid when you look at how the money's moving, and that clearly is forward. I want to ask about Tesla, Keith, because we'll get that report after the close today. This is a wildly uh, popular, spoken about stock and company, of course, on the social media sphere. What is your expectation for Tesla? Well, I own it. And, you know, there are times where it's one of the most frustrating stocks I've ever encountered in my entire 45 plus years of doing this. But that doesn't change the fact that he's changing the world. So I'm willing to put up with the shenanigans because we're on the cusp of AI, robotics, the robo taxis. I think Wall Street is tremendously underestimating everything that Musk is trying to achieve. And the parallels would be like betting against jobs back in the day. Interesting. So what does the future of Tesla look like? I know you've mentioned that it's reinventing itself in some capacity uh, beyond just electric cars. Well, that's the thing. People think about it in terms of EVs, but that is really such a tiny microcosm of what they do. And so over time, you know, this reminds me of 2014 when Apple first unveiled services. Today, that's a hundred billion dollar division, second only to iPhone sales. I think between subscriptions, data, energy storage, transmission, robotic, et cetera, EVs are actually going to be an increasing, decreasing segment of Tesla's overall revenue and profit picture, and that the reverse will be true, and it's going to catch a lot of people by surprise. Interesting. So I know you said, obviously, stay the course as we approach the election. Any sort of election outcome that you think might impact the direction for stocks? 
Well, I tell you what, I do, I do money. I don't do politics. I'm not smart enough to figure that out. So, you know, I think barring a major exogenous shock, you know, if, for example, war in the Middle East accelerates, uh, Jerome Powell resigns. Um, you know, I think that the markets are just going to chug ahead. Uh, okay, so I got that uh, straight there. Money is the focus, Keith, for you. We are awaiting remarks in the boardroom here at the New York Stock Exchange. WNBA's New York Liberty uh, here to celebrate the opening bell after clinching the championship win on Sunday in Game 5, defeating the Minnesota Lynx. Keith, if I have to jump in, that's why we got to get that traffic straight. Uh, but another question to you. In the meantime here, uh, Coca-Cola, another company reporting, obviously gives us a sense of the consumer. International as well. We've talked about the health of the U.S. economy. What are you seeing on an international level? Well, same kind of thing. You know, there's very much a split between the haves and have-nots. The the companies and countries that are going forward and those that aren't. What I liked about the Coca-Cola earnings was even though they're sluggish, the pricing power is still there. So, you know, I was happy with the numbers. I wish they were higher, but I wasn't unpleased or displeased, I guess would be the word with Coca-Cola. I don't own it, but, you know, I'm going to look at it because Coke, Pepsi, you know, they're pretty much indispensable. Are you an, are you a WNBA fan? <laughs> I was the worst kid in PE when it came to basketball, let me tell you. But I love the game, love the sport, love those athletes. They're doing a phenomenal job, and they're great to watch. You know, it's interesting. Uh, we had a company on yesterday, the co-founder of Vestable, and investing in some of these athletes when they're younger, of course, with NIL, following their career trajectories, and actually being able to make money off of them is another market that we're following, in addition to stocks, which I know we're focused on here. So a good tie-in as, as we await those exclusive boardroom remarks from the New York Liberty team and the GM is going to join me a little bit later on the show. Uh, Keith, consolidation is good here. You mentioned anything that would cause, let's say, a correction in a 10% pullback that our viewers should be aware of. Well, number one, if it is a 10% pullback, you know, the markets are the only store on earth where people fear a sale. So I would welcome that because it would give me the opportunity to accumulate better stocks more different positions, you know, those kinds of things. But, you know, it's going to be something exogenous to the market. It's going to be something they don't count on. The phrase black swan is overused. It's more like gray swans at this point. But a sharp rise in rates would do it. Some kind of financial hiccup at the Fed. You know, that would clearly royal the markets. But again, longer term history, Kristen, that is inevitably an opportunity of epic proportions if you've got the guts to take advantage of it. You know, there's been such a focus on these richly valued high-flying technology names, certainly two years into the bull market, Keith, that names like NVIDIA, for instance, even in Tesla at one point, and of course, other big names like Amazon and Apple really have been driving the gains. They gained even more market share, uh, share as people have invested in them. I just got the cue. We got to go to the boardroom. Keith, we'll check in with you after the bell, and let's take a listen to those exclusive remarks.